afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Veloso Tours. Thank you for joining our webinar on uh, Argentina, Chile, and uh, expedition cruises. My name is Paolo Veloso. I'm the managing director of Veloso Tours. The topics of this uh, webinar uh, are going to be, uh, first I will have a um, presentation. I will talk about um, an introduction to Veloso Tours and life in um, Argentina and Chile and our passion for Argentina and Chile. Then we will have our main guide in uh, Buenos Aires, Emiliano, joining us um, from Buenos Aires directly. Nick is going to talk about um, Buenos Aires, Iguazu, the north of Argentina in Salta and the Atacama. And then the area further south from Santiago to the Lake region. We also have uh, Gabriela joining us from Bariloche where she's uh, going to talk about all the ex wonderful excursions that she does in the uh, Lake region. Then I will talk about the South, Calafate, the Perito Moreno, Patagonia and Torres del Paine and the expedition cruises. And then Nick will go through the um, various itineraries that we have um, to suggest it, to join all these regions together. The presentation will follow more or less across the points of crossing between uh, Chile and Argentina. So first in the north, then uh, Santiago and Mendoza, the lake region, and down in the south. Uh, in terms of um, housekeeping, if I may ask you to um, set the Zoom to a uh, speaker so that you will see the person who is speaking. And also, as we have uh, several people in different parts of the world, joining if there's any technical issue i am um, i'm sorry i am um, just be patient while we resolve it which i'm sure we will also um the um at the end we'll have some questions and answers and so we'd ask you to send questions to berenice as we go along there is a button on uh, the zoom chat which um uh, says, um, yeah, it's called Zoom, Zoom chat. So you send questions to Berenice and then we'll collect those questions at the end. The Loso Tours, uh, as we, as you see, we've been uh, organizing itineraries and tours in uh, South America for over 20 years. The ethos of the Loso Tours is to provide authentic experiences by focusing on your interests, by uh, asking you uh, what are your main interests and then sharing an understanding of local life, people and customs, mostly through our guides and adapting the excursions to fit your interests. We offer mostly private tours. We place a great emphasis on our local guides because they're the face of Veloso Tours when you are there looking after you. We have, um, in terms of the COVID current COVID situation, uh, we're not going to really say much about it because um, it's always changing and it will be whatever the authorities decide at the time when you are traveling. Uh, suffice to say that there's travel insurance that covers COVID and that the flexible booking conditions are essentially based on um, making full payment as late as possible when we know that everything is operating and the flights are operating and it's um, possible to go to, and travel and so on. We are recording this uh, uh, webinar in order to um, be able to make it available on our website later. So if anyone has missed anything, then we can always refer to it later. Veloso Tours, in the last year, we have produced a new brochure on Latin America. So it's available to send by post. If you have not received one yet, you can do so by contacting us or by email or phone or to our website. We've also made numerous improvements to our website, including new tours, 
many uh, new photographs and particularly also a download uh, feature where you can download the itinerary based on a choice of uh, starting dates in order to experiment with durations. And we will show you that happening, how it works at the end of the trip. And that will cover all the itineraries in Latin America, China and India. Our fascination with uh, Argentina really comes from this variety of, um, of landscapes and uh, way of life. So it's a very large country and you have glaciers in the south, a lake re region in the center, and um, the Andean landscapes, which are so varied because it's stretched so far north and south. Essentially, you have a central dry area because most of the uh, fronts come from the Pacific and the um, rain falls on, on, on the Chilean side and at the top of the Andes. So the center is quite dry. And a lot of the um, fronts from the South Atlantic go into Buenos Aires and then move north towards Brazil. So we're going to talk about south in the north, Mendoza and uh, Bariloche, which is the lake region. Calafate. The region of Puerto Madryn, we're not really to talk about uh, on this occasion, it'll have to be for another time, but its uh, main interest is wildlife, lots of uh, sea lions, elephants, seals, whales from uh, more or less October through to January. With Chile is uh, similar, but obviously a much um, narrower country on the western side of the Andes from the Atacama mountain deserts in the north to the fjords and glaciers in the south of Patagonia with a temperate region in the middle so the Mediterranean climate. As you can see here from Kalama, we're going to uh, um, follow this presentation is going to follow these crossings between uh, Salta and San Pedro, San Mendoza and Santiago, in the lake region and down in the south from from Punta Arenas and, and to um, Perito Moreno to Torres del Paine. And um, now to start the tour, I would like to uh, bring in Emiliano Carascal, who's our main guide in uh, Buenos Aires. We've worked with him for many years. He's very experienced and he knows Buenos Aires very well. And so Emiliano, if I can ask you to come in. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? So I'm, I'm so pleased to be part in this uh, webinar of Chile and Argentina. Well, Paulo introduced me. Uh, my name is Emiliano and I've been guiding in Buenos Aires for the last 20 years. Um, during almost that long, I work with Veloso travelers who visit us. Um, so I, I can say that I really know what is the company philosophy and, and the travels profile. So I would like to share with you um, what a typical Veloso traveler stay would be like in Buenos Aires. Uh, first of all, we escort you privately from the airport to your accommodation. We make sure that everything is in order, is running smoothly. And after that, once you are settling your room, we invite you to join an orientation walk or walking introduction in order for you to get your bearings of the hotel surroundings. In that, in that occasion, uh, it's important that you um, clarify any questions that you may have. We also share some insider tips, some recommendations for you to have confidence enough, enough to explore the area on your own. Um, so um, we think that uh, a perfect combination that free time activities and uh, organized activities is key to a successful stay. Um, we may help you organizing some uh, sporting events you may been dreaming of in the last couple of months or even getting a, getting a ticket in the, the, in the Teatro Colón or Colón Theater, which is one of the three most important opera houses in the world or even getting you a table in that particular restaurant that you've been recommended by your foodie friends. So um, that's important. I mean, balance between 
um, organized um, activities and free time recommendations. So now I would like to show you where am I? Let me just flip over this. Okay. So here I'm having a coffee in a really nice cafe in Palermo. So you can really see the atmosphere, people outside in this beautiful terrace across Costa Rica Square. So there you can see how life is just really normal, cobblestone streets, leafy trees, leaving the, the leaves, uh, you know. So this is Palermo, this is an area that went through a gentrification process uh, in the last 20 years. Uh, so it was just a residential area like any other. And today uh, is one of the trendiest, uh, one of the most lively areas in town is full of cozy restaurants, bars, cafes, trendy shops, boutique hotels. So it's the perfect area for you to stroll around and um, get to these uh, off the beaten tracks places that we used to, to recommend. Um, so there you can see a little bit more of the ambience and the atmosphere. It's a beautiful sunny autumn day in Buenos Aires. Just to end with, um, I think that there is nothing like traveling and uh, that traveling also is like a bridge that brings people together. So uh, knowing a new culture, trying new foods, um, interact with locals is um, what we propose you to do when you are here in, in Buenos Aires. So there are so many more areas other than Palermo, many, many landmarks in the city to be discovered. And I think that Nick is going to talk about them shortly. So I can really wait to have you here uh, sharing a, a, a coffee with me in this beautiful terrace. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Emiliano. Good to see uh, life on the street in Buenos Aires there. Um, Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name's Nick and I'm going to take you on a relatively quick tour around uh, a number of parts of Argentina and Chile, starting off with Buenos Aires, where uh, we've just heard from Emiliano. Um, Buenos Aires is really a very sophisticated and European style uh, city, at the same time as having quite a distinct Latin identity. So it is very different from uh, a number of the the other places that you probably would have visited. Um, it's a very big city, uh, as Emiliano suggested, which is uh, exactly the reason you would want to have an expert local guide like Emiliano to show you around. Um, and these are the, some of the things that you could see in, in the downtown area, for example, wonderful uh, statues, the uh, obelisk there in, in the center of the uh, uh, main avenue. Um, you've got wonderful, European style architecture um, in the upmarket Recoleta region. This is the Casa, Casa Rosada, the uh, presidential palace uh, there on the main square in the center. Um, and really worthwhile spending a, a good amount of time in, in this area. Here are some of the interiors you might see in some of the grand buildings. On the uh, right hand side actually is the inside of a, a well-known shopping mall. These are the kinds of uh, you know, this is the kind of design that you can see in, in these places. Um, particularly in upmarket Recoleta, uh, there are also green spaces. Uh, this is the square outside the gate to the famous Recoleta Cemetery. Um, but also nice parks and squares. Here you can see the wonderful jacaranda trees in flower as they do every uh, November. Um, this also uh, just off uh, Recoleta Park. Um, Closer to Palermo, you've got the Palermo Rose Garden, uh, which is uh, a lovely place to, to go and visit on a 
on a sunny day. Uh, Palermo, as we've seen uh, from Emiliano Live, has got these wonderful cobbled streets, cafes, bars, restaurants. It's quite a, a trendy, fashionable neighborhood, but it's got excellent boutique hotels as well and could be um, it could be a good choice to stay in if you'd li like to be somewhere a little bit more uh, homely rather than the uh, the high rise of the center of the city. Um, down towards the south of the city, you've also got the colorful um, La Boca uh, district, which was the home traditionally of the dock workers. And the reason why you see these colorful uh, houses is because they literally took the leftover paint that they were using to uh, paint the ships and paint their own houses with it. So um, this is also a very characterful kind of old fashioned, uh, you know, workers style uh, place, part of the city to visit. In terms of particular experiences, uh, I'm sure Emiliana would love to be able to take you to one of the traditional bars like this uh, Bar Notable, where they've got the wonderful wood paneling, very sort of traditional style where you can have a, a coffee or an afternoon refreshment. Of course, uh, Argentina and Buenos Aires is the home of the tango, uh, so you might decide to uh, go to an evening tango show with dinner, uh, which range from larger theatrical style to a more intimate uh, sort of uh, small stage uh, style as well. If you'd like to get involved, then we can organise tango classes uh, and even go to the real tango parties, the milongas, where people, uh, real people go to uh, dance. There's also polo. Uh, they love polo in Argentina. This is the uh, Palermo uh, polo field uh, and fantastic to watch, you know, really world class polo um, with the city in the background there. Uh, again, a really sort of characteristic activity that you can do when staying in Buenos Aires. In terms of hotels, there's a huge range uh, of styles. Um, standards and uh, and locations as well. This is one of our favourites in uh, upmarket Recoleta called the Louis Suites. Uh, it's got a swimming pool, uh, but for somewhere a bit more characterful boutique style, there's also the Legado Mitico, which is just up the road for uh, where, Emil where Emiliano was uh, in Palermo. Also in Buenos Aires, there are a number of uh, day trips that you can take outside of the city, for example, going to an estancia. These are the historical ranches, which were kind of the center of the, the uh, agricultural uh, society that what was made, what made Argentina very rich. Uh, and you can go out, many of these have now been kind of converted into hotels and places where you can go for lunch and do some activities uh, or just sit and relax and have a lunch. Uh, they do particularly good barbecues uh, in these places as well. So it's lovely to be able to get out into the, the countryside for a day. Or going across the uh, River Plate to Uruguay uh, for a day trip to Colonia, uh, which is a very old uh, city, one of the oldest cities in uh, South America, where you've again got lovely cobbled streets and traditional, um, uh, you know, traditional feel and you can have uh, lunch out on the terrace there. Uh, and then take the ferry back to Buenos Aires in the afternoon. So that's another uh, worthwhile day trip to take. Moving on uh, then from Buenos Aires up to Iguazu Falls. Um, Iguazu is a series of waterfalls, as you can see from this uh, picture. It's on the border with Zil and surrounded by verdant subtropical forest. Um, the map that uh, you can see here shows you uh, not only the extent of the falls, but also the number of different trails uh, that you can walk along to explore the forest and get different viewpoints of, of the falls as well. It straddles the border uh, between Argentina and Brazil, and it's absolutely worth seeing the falls from both sides uh, because you get a different perspective. Uh, from Brazil, you get a more panoramic view over here, seeing uh, across all of these falls, whereas the um, more extensive uh, trails on the Argentine side really allow you to get up close. Um, and so, uh, as you'll see from the pictures here, uh, you know, you can really get up close to the falls, can get quite well, wet from the spray, of course. Um, but given the number of opportunities for, for walking along the various walkways, absolutely worthwhile spending a good day uh, on either side, depending on the amount of time you've got for your holiday. 
Um, other alter, uh, options there are uh, taking a, a boat trip actually on the river, as you can see in the uh, picture on the left hand side there, um, or just walking with a guide along the trails to the viewpoints, as I've mentioned. Um, lots of wildlife also within the forest, such as birds and, and mammals, and monkeys, etc. In terms of accommodation, on the Brazilian side, you've got the very luxurious and sophisticated Belmond das Cataratas, which has got a lovely uh, big swimming pool, as you can see there, and very um, sophisticated historical style rooms. Uh, whereas on the Argentine side, uh, you've got the Gran Milia Iguazu, which is uh, also more, more modern, but still very upmarket, and actually has uh, rooms with views of the falls. Um, there are plenty of other hotels uh, further away in, in the local town as well, so there is a good uh, range to choose from. Moving on then up to the northwest of uh, Argentina to uh, the Salta region. This is a desert region, uh, and as you can see from the map here, it borders uh, you've got Bolivia on the uh, in the north and Chile to the west, uh, and Salta is the main city that you would be flying into here to to access this region. Um, but a number of other uh, cities and and small towns in this region that are absolutely worthwhile visiting, such as Cafayate down to the south, uh, Purmamarca and Humahuaca up to the north that I'll uh, mention in a moment. Um, the distances in this region are relatively long, so the day they can be quite long days if you're going as a day trip from Salta. Alternatively, it's possible to spend the night in, in any of these uh, towns and uh, make a sort of circular trip over several days. Salta itself has wonderful colonial architecture. Uh, it's a small but striking city full of uh, picturesque squares. Um, uh, with wonderful uh, monuments like this, for example. Again, you can see the jacaranda trees here. Um, Salta itself is relatively green uh, because it's in a microclimate uh, within the desert. But as soon as you get uh, any distance outside of the uh, city, then you're in rugged uh, desert. Uh, you know, you look at that, you're, you're outside of the city and you think, wow, this is real uh, impressive desert. This is, uh, for example, one of the places you can uh, jump out of the car to take pictures on the road down to Cafayate. Um, uh, views like this or going into the uh, small canyons to really see almost from inside the, the uh, rock formations and just marvel at the, uh, uh, at the desert. Uh, down uh, on the route to uh, Cafayate, there are also uh, wineries and it's possible to taste wine down there as well. Um, so that makes a really uh, worthwhile day trip from Salta. Then heading out north, you've got uh, landscapes like this, wonderful canyon. This is called the Humahuaca Gorge and you can see the high mountains either side, but um, small stream that runs through the center there that, that provides the greenery here. Um, and heading north uh, through the Humahuaca Gorge, you get to small towns like Purmamarca. This is a very small uh, traditional town with uh, sort of adobe uh, uh, buildings, sort of mud brick buildings still, and, and the central square here where they have a market, or all the way to the town of Humahuaca where you've got this sort of desert uh, type architecture uh, as well. If you head up into the mountains from, from the gorge, this is the road that goes up behind Burma Marca. You can uh, drive along these switchback roads uh, right up into the high mountains, as you can see here, until you get to the high Puna, uh, the salt flats here that are, that are over 4,000 meters above sea level. And uh, as you can see, just stunning scenery, uh, incredibly flat and, um, and pretty empty, to be honest, as well. You don't get that many visitors up here uh, like you do in uh, at the salt flats in uh, Chile and Bolivia. Back in Salta, there are also cultural activities such as traditional music and dancing. Uh, this is uh, a uh, popular night spot where you can go out and have some dinner, watch some shows, for example. Absolutely worthwhile to sort of get into the, the Northern Argentine spirit. Um, and in terms of accommodation, 
the Legado Mitico also has an outpost in uh, Salta as well, which we very much like, again, a uh, cultural um, uh, sort of boutique hotel uh, style. So Paolo mentioned that we would uh, talk about crossings between Argentina and Chile, and uh, this is the first one that we're going to feature, which is how you would get from Salta to San Pedro de Atacama in the north of Chile. Uh, this is quite a long distance uh, and you have to go up and over the mountains and so it takes quite a while, a good seven hours. Uh, if you go by public bus it will take longer than that as well. We can arrange for you to go with a private driver or you can go by public bus. Um, but again, wow, the scenery uh, on that uh, crossing will be absolutely stunning. So moving on then to the Atacama Desert, uh, this is in the north of Chile now. Um, to contrast it with Salta, this is really a true uh, desert. Um, you can see here on the left, San Pedro, uh, on, in the center of the map, you've got the Salar, the salt flat of Atacama, and then you know, a, a number of very small villages, but otherwise really in the uh, middle of the desert. This map on the right here is actually on the wall uh, of one of our favorite lodges, so, um, so that they can illustrate exactly where you'll be going on the day trips. Uh, San Pedro de Atacama is a very small town, just of, you know, one story, uh, small brick and adobe uh, buildings. Um, it's worth a, a look to see the sort of old churches and things like that, but really the reason that you go to the Atacama is to get out into the desert to see the stunning landscape. Um, this is for the, for example, the remains of uh, of a very old church uh, out in a, a small village near the El Tatio Gizas that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, here we've got um, the remnants of uh, artifacts that have been found in the desert that show that. Uh, actually, contrary to what you might think, people have been living in these areas in the deserts for thousands of years. Uh, this is, um, these artifacts can be found in the small um, museum in San Pedro and absolutely worth a look as well. But you can see here uh, the stunning desert landscapes, you know, jagged mountains, uh, small lagoons around which you can sometimes find birds or even flamingos flocking. Um, absolutely stunning landscape and incredible quality of light for photography as well. Um, so if you're keen to go to the desert and see these kinds of incredible uh, shapes and colours and take photographs, this is absolutely one of your best bets. The El Tatio Gizas are one of the highlights. Uh, 100 foot high plumes of steam shoot out of these hot springs uh, every morning at dawn. Um, and so to visit it, of course, you've got to get up before dawn uh, and get up there in a, a bus or a vehicle. Uh, so it is an early start, but wow, what, a, what a, a show it is once you're there. And generally on the trip, you would go, you would spend some time walking around. There are even uh, hot uh, water pools that you can swim in, uh, if you like. The water is very warm, but then when you get out, the air is extremely cold. So uh, that's... a a warning for you, um, but absolutely worthwhile. And then you would generally get back to town and back to your lodge uh, in time for lunch so you can rest in the afternoon. Other activities are absolutely worthwhile doing are stargazing. Uh, you may be aware that uh, the Atacama has some of the clearest skies in the world. That's why they have uh, professional um, uh, observatories up there, but many of the lodges also have uh, their own telescopes uh, and uh, sort of small consumer observatories, if you like, to take advantage of the clear skies and look at the stars and the planets, etc. Um, not something that uh, we often get to do uh, in this country, so certainly worthwhile uh, taking advantage of that. For people who are a bit more active, you've got activities like cycling or maybe just going for a short walk in the desert and being met back uh, by your guide uh, with a picnic lunch overlooking uh, the landscape. There is wildlife out there as well. Here you can see some uh, very well kept uh, llamas on the left, as well as some wild, uh, probably either vicuña or, or wanaco uh, out there in the desert. Also flamingos, as I mentioned, which are found around the uh, around the uh, high altitude lagoons. 
Alto Atacama Lodge is one of our favorite lodges there. Uh, they provide all meals uh, and have an excellent selection of uh, activities on offer as well as very characterful uh, and comfortable accommodation. The Altiplanico Hotel, a little bit more simple, but still very, uh, you know, characterful of the desert with the stones and the uh, adobe uh, structure. Uh, and they've got a lovely pool there as well, where you can uh, relax after a long day uh, out in the desert. Um, moving on then uh, to Mendoza, coming down to uh, the sort of mid region of, uh, of Argentina. This is Argentina. Um, Mendoza, as you may well be aware, is the wine growing capital of Argentina. You can see here the rows of vines and their sheer proximity to the very high mountains of, of the Andes, which is pretty much your constant backdrop. Mendoza itself is a uh, small, charming city full of tree-lined streets, uh, squares, fountains. Uh, there's some lovely parks there, for example. Um, but the main reason that you're visiting really is to uh, visit the wineries uh, and we would recommend going out uh, on a day trip, maybe visiting two or three with an expert local guide where you'll be able to um, walk a little bit among the vines but also learn how they make the wine, what the different processes are, uh, do a little tasting and perhaps uh, if you like even have a specially made lunch uh, that uh, is specially designed to pair well with the wines, uh, which is certainly one of the treats that I enjoyed when I was there. Uh, here you can see an example of, uh, you know, some of the huge barrels uh, where you might be tasting some of the wines in the, in the barrel room uh, and a lovely lunch there on the right hand side. Also uh, opportunities to do activities in Mendoza, such as cycling. Um, here are uh, some uh, horse riders, some sort of real gauchos that I saw on the side of the road as I was driving past. Um, Mendoza, uh, I chose to uh, get around there in a hire car um, because uh, the roads are quite well kept, there are good vehicles for hire uh, and you might choose to do that if you want to be particularly independent but of course we can also provide uh, private drivers and guides to uh, take you around. Of course if you do decide to drive yourself you've got to make sure you uh, have a designated driver uh, to bring you back from the tastings. Here again you can see an example of uh, just how close the, the uh, snow-capped peaks of the Andes are from, uh, from the vines uh, and this is uh, taken from uh, one of the hotels out in the wine country. As for hotels, of course there are uh, hotels in the city of Mendoza but a far more uh, sort of characteristic stay would be to stay at one of the wineries like the Finca Adalgisa is a relatively small, uh, simple and homely one. Uh, but there's also the Cavas Wine Lodge, which is a, a wonderful, luxurious Relais Chateau uh, property, uh, again, surrounded by uh, vineyards. Moving on from Mendoza to Santiago then, you can see that they are more or less on a par uh, on the map here. Um, again, this crossing would take you up and over the Andes, so uh, it is sort of deceptively short on the map. It would take most of a day uh, to get there. And again, we can provide a private driver and guide to take you so that you have your personalised service, or equally it can be done uh, on a public bus, uh, which are you know, very comfortable and, and uh, decent way of, uh, of getting you up and over the Andes. Fantastic views from the top over down uh, both sides of uh, uh, both sides of the Andes. So um, certainly worthwhile if you're if you're happy to spend the day in a vehicle. So coming in to Santiago then, Santiago de Chile is the capital of Chile. Um, and it's really your most likely going to be your first stop in Chile unless you are crossing in on one of the crossings that uh, that we describe uh, because pretty much all of the international flights to Chile uh, land here. It's a charming sophisticated silly city full of arts and history and green spaces. Uh, you can see here the um, fine arts museum again with wonderful flowering jacaranda trees uh, and uh, fountains and uh, uh, statues in the gardens surrounding. Um, it's got a wonderful central market that still uh, sells fresh food and fish. Chile of course has a very long coastline uh, so there's a lot of fishing done there, a lot of fish eaten all up and down the country 
uh, very fresh and definitely worth trying. Um, and you can even try some at the Mercado Central because there is a restaurant in, in the uh, middle of the market where you can have lunch. In terms of accommodation options, very uh, characterful and charming small boutique hotels like Le Rêve. Uh, and um, it's also worthwhile going outside of the city uh, on trips, for example, to the local vineyards. Santiago is pretty much surrounded by uh, vineyards in the Aconcagua, Casablanca and Colchagua valleys. Um, and that works well just as a day trip to visit a couple of vineyards and uh, have lunch, uh, similar to the way you would do in Mendoza, or you could uh, spend a night here, uh, which also works well at the end of your trip uh, to perhaps have a night to relax before uh, flight home uh, at a relaxing uh, vineyard accommodation. But it's also possible to go back up into the Andes uh, to visit one of the national parks up there, like the Cajon del Maipo or the uh, Campana or Yerba Loca national parks, really make the most of that mountain scenery with the lagoons and, and forests up there. If you'd like to uh, get out, feel the fresh air in your lungs and, uh, and stretch your legs for a day. So now uh, I'm going to describe one of our itineraries, uh, which is a self-drive uh, itinerary, which starts in Santiago and then moves down through into the Lake District of uh, Chile, through the wine regions also. Um, Valparaiso is a very colourful port city, um, not far from Santiago, only about an hour to an hour and a half. This can also be visited on a day trip. Uh, but in fact, uh, we love it so much that we think that it's absolutely worthwhile spending uh, a night or, or two there. There are excellent restaurants there, excellent fish restaurants, because uh, it's right on the coast. Um, and as you'll see, uh, it's full of uh, arts and colour and um, really nice place just to be able to wander around. Uh, a lot of the neighbourhoods are actually on the hillside that are overlooking the port. Uh, and so it's very easy just to um, walk along these uh, walkways and dip into art galleries and, and things like that. Uh, Valparaiso, very close to my heart uh, because um, my grandparents lived there for over 30 years and I've been traveling there since uh, uh, almost before I can remember uh, very regularly. So uh, always fond memories uh, to go back there. Moving down a little bit further south then to Santa Cruz and the wine region. Um, the wineries in the uh, uh, the Santa Cruz region are just that little bit further from Santiago that make it not quite so um, practical to do as a day trip from uh, Santiago. But there are excellent hotels uh, both in the town of Santa Cruz and uh, on the vineyards surrounding uh, and absolutely worthwhile to uh, spend some time here, perhaps park the car and uh, spend a day either riding horses or um, tasting the local wines or perhaps cycling as well, uh, just enjoying the wonderful uh, sort of rugged uh, valley landscape that you have there in central Chile. Moving down a little bit further to Pucón, that's a longer jump and we suggest an intermediate night halfway down so that you're not uh, doing too much driving in one day. Uh, Pucón is absolutely the sort of centre of, of things in, uh, in the Chilean Lake District. Um, very green, surrounded by forest, uh, but wonderful lakes. And in the uh, in the background, you can start to see from here uh, the sort of characteristic snow-capped peaks and and volcanoes, uh, which feed the rivers that feed down into many of these lakes. So, of course, the water is very cold. In case you were thinking of uh, dipping a toe in, um, but surrounded by national parks, uh, lots of excellent walking and hiking to be done around here at a variety of levels as well. So, you know, you don't have to be incredibly intrepid to uh, enjoy this scenery. Uh, and again, worthwhile going with a guide uh, or having a, a plan for your day uh, of what you want to do so that you can make sure that you're doing something that's uh, best suited to your level. <clears throat> Hotel Antumalal is one of our favourite hotels in, in Pucón. Uh, their claim to fame is that uh, the Queen actually stayed there on her tour of Chile in the late 1960s, uh, which, uh, and they still have a portrait of the Queen hanging in, uh, in the hotel. It's a wonderful sort of 1940s modernist style, not something you see very much uh, 
anymore, but still very classy and uh, beautiful um, sort of location there, perched on the hill, looking out over the uh, lake. Uh, and it's got a wonderful veranda where you can have breakfast overlooking the lake in the morning. Moving on, uh, there's also the Vira Vira Lodge, which is a little bit further away from the town of Pucon, uh, set in its own uh, private um, property. Uh, but it's got a river running through it, which actually leads to uh, the lake where Pucon is. Uh, this is a luxury lodge uh, where you have um, three meals a day and all the activities provided uh, and a, a good range of activities there as well that you can't find elsewhere. Um, for example, when I was there a few years ago, they allowed me to uh, actually help the uh, chef making some fresh cheese, uh, which was very interesting. I'm not sure if they're doing that anymore. We'll have to check. Moving on then to Puerto Varas, um, this is uh, a little bit further south, but still in the Chilean Lake District. And you can see again in the background that characteristic uh, conical uh, volcano with the snow cap, uh, that's the uh, Osorno volcano. Uh, Puerto Varas, a wonderful, charming little lakeside town um, where there are a number of good uh, hotels and restaurants, but it's also possible to do day trips out of there. Uh, to either get a little bit closer to the volcano or visit the national parks and the uh, waterfalls like uh, the Petroe Falls that you can see on the right hand there. So moving over from uh, Puerto Varas to Bariloche in Argentina, this is the next crossing that we're going to discuss. This can either be done uh, by road, uh, which would take uh, about five hours driving, or what we much prefer is to take a uh, boat and bus combination trip, which takes a full day uh, up and over the Andes through the mountain lakes for absolutely stunning scenery. You can see here on the left, Puerto Varas, you take a bus up to uh, Petroe Lake, uh, and then you get on a boat to sail across this uh, lake, and then uh, another bus journey across um, from Peugeot, where you uh, also cross the border up here and then you get on another boat and then suddenly you're in Argentina. Uh, so that's a full day uh, crossing through those uh, wonderful mountain landscapes um, arriving uh, in the evening in, in Bariloche. And you can see here, for example, some of the landscapes and this is the kind of boat that you would uh, be going on. It's worth mentioning also about the Chilean Lake District. It is very green because, as Paolo mentioned, a lot of the weather uh, and the rain comes in off the Pacific, so they do get a lot of precipitation. Uh, but that's one of the things that differentiates it from the Argentine Lake District that uh, Gabby will tell you about in a minute, uh, and one of the reasons why it's worth visiting uh, both sides. So moving on to uh, Bariloche then. Uh, this is a stunning uh, little lakeside town. Uh, got wonderful lake vistas almost uh, everywhere you uh, look. Um, lots of activities that uh, Gabby is going to uh, talk to you about in a moment, uh, and a number of good uh, accommodation options as well, uh, both in the town of Bariloche and around the north side of the lake on which uh, Bariloche is located is a little town called Via Langas Angostura and we particularly like the Las Balsas Hotel there because it's sophisticated, charming, quite homely but very high standards and uh, is also part of the Relais Chateau uh, network as well. So uh, without further ado I'm going to let you speak here from the real expert uh, in Bariloche, that's uh, Gabi Segura who is our specialist mm -hmm. guide in uh, Bariloche. Uh, and she's going to tell you about all the things that you can do there. Well, thank you, Nick. Uh, it's, uh, well, I'm Gabriela. It's a real pleasure to meet you all. A nice pleasure to be here. It's been a wonderful opportunity to be a host for Veloso Tours uh, all these years. I'm really motivated about that. Um, I'm in... I lived abroad many years. I lived in Madrid. I had the opportunity of living in London. There's where I met Paula and we exchanged many interesting ideas on tourism. And then I studied English public translation at the university and also tourism here in Bariloche. 
And then I decided to come back home right now. This is where I am. So welcome to my house. This is my house where I live. Uh, I would like to show you a little bit about uh, my house. And so welcome in, come in inside. I'll change the camera. So it's a very beautiful day. I hope you can see. I live in a, in a wooden house and at the outskirts of Bariloche city. I'm gonna go outside. It's a wooden house um, that we built with my husband um, and a friend. Uh, we were young, we had no kids back then and we had a lot of patience. It took us around four years to build it. And, you know, so we build a, a house and we have a, a greenhouse and orchard, a lot of fruit trees. Right now you can see maybe the apple trees. We have plum trees, cherry trees, pears, and a nice natural swim pond that we built and sign there. So it's a very beautiful day, as you can see. Uh, it's a beautiful, uh, we are in autumn here in Mariloche. And there you can see a little bit of blue sky house and the beautiful colors just so, so you can see a little bit around the house and the views yeah we are surrounded by a beautiful forest of native cypress trees um, they grow only in this latitude and nowhere else in the world even though we share we have common names everywhere but this is the Australopithecus chilensis species that grows here so it's a very peaceful beautiful day as you can see yeah i have we have chickens and hens so it's nice again coming in my house so we designed it then we have three kids and uh, paulo was very generous he invited us over to his house. <laughs> uh, so we stayed there with my kids. Uh, it was an amazing experience for me to be able to show my kids the place where I had lived uh, for so many years. And uh, you know, all the memories that came with it. I don't know, can you see me? Oh, yes. Okay, yeah. Camera. Yes, there I am. <laughs> as I said, I, I worked as a tour leader and a tour guide for Veloso Tours, uh, guiding you know, uh, around uh, Chile and Argentina, where I was very fortunate uh, to meet uh, interesting people, some of very amazing people actually, and many I, co I can consider my friends. Uh, and um, being a frequent traveler myself, I know more or less about the expectations, the anxiety, you know, what you're looking for, when you, especially when you travel long distances and searching for different things, for new things and to discover and to be surprised, to be surprised by nature and the differences and perhaps also the similarities that we share, we have in common with other places. So I'm going to show you a little bit about uh, the place we know as Bariloche. Bariloche is a city surrounded by a national park, one of the biggest and the oldest. As a matter of fact, we are covering an area full of national parks where uh, both Argentina and Chile, the idea is to protect the Andes. No? And there you can see, we can practice. I'm a very outdoor person myself. Uh, we practice a lot of sports, mainly in the summertime, uh, with rafting, kayaking, horse riding. Uh, there you can see the Andes. Behind the mountains there, like you can see me also. I'm standing on top of that rock there, opening my arms there, welcoming you. And behind those mountains is Chile. So that's, those are the, the famous Andes. This is a, a long mountain chain that goes all, stretches all along the west part of South America. Um, and so there you can see, also see the Nahuel Huapi National uh, Park. It's the Nahuel, uh, that we have the same name of the uh, lake. You see, this is our lake district, mm, Nahuel Huapi. Uh, well, now, well, Wapi is in, actually it's in Mapudungun language, which is the native language. It could be translated as a tiger island, uh, but there, you know, there are not many tigers here. So perhaps a, a better translation, an interpretation of the name Nawel, maybe otter, 
We have a lot of lake otters in this lake. Unfortunately, the, the population has been drastically reduced. So the idea right now is at the national park is protecting all these endangered species that live here. They can see the otter. It's a very nice looking animal. Apparently there were many more in the past. So now right now they are being protected. It's important because they play an important role in nature. There are many relationships going on among different species. So each, each one is really important. There you can see the crystal clear lakes and beautiful waters that you navigate. So there are many, many activities that you could perform in the summer, in the winter, the ski resort, during the autumn. This is right now with the autumn, it's amazing time. When you can see all the trees shedding their leaves, you know, preparing themselves for the winter to come. And then the Cathedral Mountain, which is our main ski resort. So we welcome a lot of skiers in the winter. Then in the springtime, the blossom of all the trees, it's very nice to see. Um, amazing looking colors and flowers everywhere. Um, it's, it's really nice. It's, it's, it's on the summer for kayaking. We practice a lot of water sports and we swim in the lake. It's, uh, it's cold, as Nick said, but, uh, but it's also very healthy for us. <laughs> we are used to swimming and it improves your blood circulation, they said. And it's drinkable water, something you don't get to see many places. And there's, those are the caves uh, that we can find. So we go from the, the famous Patagonian step. Now this dry, uh, barren plateau, you know, this vastness of the, the Patagonian step. And also the tiny little plants that grow there, very colorful. It's like a colorful carpet. Especially during the springtime, it's nice to, nice to see that area. And those are the caves. Those are remnants from what used to be old volcanoes. And right, uh, they were used as for, as for nomadic tribes, you know, as temporary dwelling places. Um, and nowadays, most of that area is used, as, as you can see, as nesting grounds for the biggest flying bird here in the National Park, the king of the Anders, which is the condor. Yeah. So there you can see very nice, the vastness, the step. And then in a very short distance, we go west behind those clouds because the mountains, you know, trapped or catches the clouds and they create this amazing environment, this lush forest, this rainforest that we have going towards Chile, towards the Andes. So everything changes drastically and we have unique uh, trees that only grow here and nowhere else in the world. They are, um, so they are endemic and we, it's important. That's why the protection that the National Park gives them. Uh, they can see behind the mountains, you know, covered. Some of them have uh, glaciers on top. And that, so that's what gives the color, a special color. On the right hand side, you can see the, the river, that's Frias River, and it covers a lot of rock powder, which gives an amazing color to the river. And unique looking trees, like the Arashan, and then you can see the streams. And they have this beautiful cinnamon color that peels off. And then the waterfalls, which are quite impressive and something to see. It's a gorgeous forest. It's nice to, we, so we usually on our excursions, we go for walks and perhaps a driver on the excursion were left in one place and then we were picked up in a different part. And on our excursions, we, we include very nice picnic lunches by the lakes. And then those pictures I also took myself. That's a fox that's in Lopez Bay. And the one on the right hand side, it's a condor. In this case, it's a male condor. You can note, you notice it's crest and no feathers on their, on their head because they are scavengers. They play a really important role in nature because they are the cleaners. And the one below is a flying steamer duck. They usually nest behind the shorelines and they like these freshwater lakes. Uh, so it's very easy to spot them on the lakes usually. Uh, so breathtaking landscape, look at points where you can get you can either walk to the top or you can take the comfortable option of a chairlift or a cable car. So there are many different alternatives. And also these very nice sharp peaks that attract every year. We have a lot of mountain climbers that come here uh, to, you know, to ensure this new mountains full of active volcanoes, as we saw in Chile. Most of them are on the Chilean side, uh, but it's a, a new area, you know, the Andes, sharp very strong, mount beautiful mountains um, and amazing vegetation, as you can see. And there you can see we are drinking mate and we are on a lookout point. And that's an another picture where we you can see the picnic uh, that we should offer. And this is our lake district, similar and very nice. So it's a worth 
it's a visit worthwhile. Uh, we'll be very happy to, to show you around this area. You know, it's an amazing place for bird watchers, for, you know, there are so many, many interesting things to do. We have many options uh, to suit everybody's interest. And I hope you can someday uh, it's a, come all this way. I'll be expecting you when you come. <laughs> Thank you very much. And now I leave you with Paolo. Hello. So um, thank you. Well, the uh, so now I wanted to have just a map to be able to uh, show where we are. So we've crossed from um, Puerto Montt to Bariloche in the Lake District, and normally we'd fly to Calafate. Although um, it's possible to drive, I think we have uh, Dominique and Des uh, in the watching the presentation. Uh, past clients intrepid sort of uh, globe trotting uh, trailblazers who uh, drove all the way down and then took the ferry back up to Puerto Montt. And this area here of um, Calafate is mainly <clears throat> known for the Perito Moreno Glacier. This is a very impressive glacier that is um, actually uh, growing. Um, and the main uh, special feature of it is that it comes off the side of a long lake. So as it comes off the side of a long lake between two mountains, on, it reaches the opposite bank. And uh, so the opposite bank becomes like a theater where you spend all day there watching and listening because um, it's not static. Bits of ice fall off. You can see how rugged the surface is. Um, you can actually organize some tracks on the surface of the uh, glacier, although it's quite tough. As you can see, the surface is um, very regular. But it's a wonderful experience to be here in uh, uh, watching the Perito Moreno in Calafate. You can also take a boat trip. So Calafate is a very special destination. There's some good hotels. Um, after having been out and about all day, there's some other ex uh, excursions that you can do in different directions. Um, so this is uh, very much uh, a must. And uh, although the, uh, uh, as the crow flies, the distance between Calafate and uh, Torres del Paine is quite short, actually. It's more or less the same mountain range. But on the road, you actually have to come all the way around to Cancha Carrera or Rio Turbio and then continue to um, Torres del Paine. So essentially, it's a day, a day of travel to relocate. And then you arrive at um, Torres del Paine. And uh, Torres del Paine is uh, an excellent destination also because you have a number of very high quality hotels here along the road. I'm showing these maps so that we can sort of get our bearings where the road skirts the lakes um, around the outside. And then you have a boat trip on the Lago Grey, which you're going to see to the Grey Glacier. And then you have these two, three, two, essentially two or three valleys here that form a W, the Ascension Valley, the Valley del Frances, and uh, the, the, the a valley here to the Grey Glacier. And uh, this uh, means that you can have a wide variety of interests, a wide variety of, uh, of uh, attractions, and also wide variety of um, terrain, of landscapes. So you can do long or short or just sightseeing walks. So it, it really is suitable for everyone. A lot of the, the hotels offer day trips. You can see here that um, you also have a lot of wildlife. This is um, taken a sort of about this time, April, May, and um, you see a lot of wildlife at this time because there's fewer people, fewer visitors. There were narcos, there are lots of ducks. This is a puma by the roadside. I took that picture as we were driving past and the Puma was totally oblivious of the car and he was actually just targeting some uh, Wanaku. So everything is thri thriving. The whole wildlife population in the Torre del Paine is thriving. And you can, as I mentioned, take a number of different activities. Horse riding is one and they offer picnics. 
this is an example also of uh, the kind of terrain, which is not difficult, is not heavy in, the, in many cases. Uh, light boots, no, no need to carry any equipment because uh, you go on day trips. And this is one example also as well-trodden trails and, uh, and some, some trees in some places. And we're going to see other landscapes. As you can see, very impressive uh, granite peaks, the Cuernos. And you can just sit and gaze and admire the landscape here with the great glacier and here in the uh, Laguna Marga. As I mentioned, uh, in terms of equipment, there's nothing much special required. Good wind protection, walking sticks, a day pack to change, because you always get warmer as you walk and then need to put on some layers uh, when you stop walking. And uh, you have terrific uh, scenery. This is a picture of my colleague, Jenny, who, uh, went up to the um, Cuernos, Las Torres, these granite peaks. Here, the walking is more difficult because you have to go over this uh, rock fall, these boulders, but it, you can see here on the right that it's uh, just normal walking in the countryside, amazing scenery. This is the view up, as you walk up towards the, um, the Cuernos, that lake. And so you don't actually see it until you get to the top and then you have the wow factor. While you're here, you're just walking up hills thinking what's gonna happen when we get to the top. And then you have this uh, amazing view when you are, when you get to the top, you see how the size of these with the uh, people who are there by the lake gives you a sense of perspective, the size of this landscape. By contrast, also, you have a glacier you can take when you take the boat trip, you come up, it's more or less a half day, so it's um, not too long and you have um, services on board. You come up to the great glacier, take pictures, see it head on. This is one of the differences with the Perito Moreno where you can be on land looking at the glacier head on. And in most other cases, you have to be on a boat to look at the glaciers head on. So here, I wanted to go back to this um, um, map, now that we've seen some pictures, to show you the, an alternative, which is these refuges. So basically, when you stay in these hotels, like the Grosseria Lago Grey and the Explorer and Las Torres, you would stay for three or four nights in order to have two or three full days of excursions on the lake, on, in the pine. And, um, you come back to the hotel to stay. If you wanted to do more trekking and walks, you, there are some refugees here, as you can see in the Ascension Valley, the Refugio Chileno. And this tells you how many hours it takes to walk more or less to the Refugio Los Cuernos. Then you would go into the Valley del Frances, possibly stay also at the Refugio Pehue. So this would be an itinerary of five nights, then trek, here, lake grass, a lake, take uh, the, tra the, um, the boat to the base here on the Lake Pewe, and then go back to the starting point at Las Torres. So for example, if you take it uh, as a day trip, it's more or less, it's two hours walk fairly flat, one hour walking fairly flat here on the Ascension Valley, and then one hour walking steeply uphill on those rocks falls that we saw, and then you have this amazing view of the towers, and then walk back. If you stay at the Refugio, it saves two hours of walking, or if you go back to um, the Las Torres, it becomes more or less a eight, nine, 10 hour day. And although that may seem a lot, um, the days are very long, you can do it at a leisurely pace. And um, so it's good to prepare beforehand or you can just take scenic trips here, just by, on, along the roadside, you have the view in front of you and there are various uh, vantage points with, for scenery all the way around the lakes, um, these lakes, and you don't have to actually do much trekking. These are some examples of these refugios. Um, they're simple, you have to sleep in a sleeping bag, 
you share the uh, accommodation in uh, communal rooms, but they have excellent food, they have uh, excellent hot showers. You don't, it means that you don't have to carry anything, basically. You can, you would just eat and um, sleep, you have a shower there every day, wholesome meals, and then you're ready to depart the following day again. The hotels that I mentioned, the Explorer is in a very central location. They have their own excursions, day trips, a choice of excursions in different directions, with their own transport and guides. So you uh, come back to the hotel, stay the night, and then the next day you go on another trip. This is an example of the Osteria Las Torres. Very good facilities and uh, excellent organization of excursions in all the park. The uh, other way to see the, um, um, this area of, of southern Chile and Argentina, and um, with uh, particularly Chile, with um, areas that you cannot reach from land, is to take a boat trip. These cruises, for example, this Scorpius would be five nights. And this is, as you can see here, is um, a more northerly area so that it combines temperate forests, hot springs with uh, reaching the uh, San Rafael Glacier, which is just on the edge of the Southern ice field. So there's no road from uh, in Chile from this area further south. You have to go into Argentina or take a ferry. And this is um, one example of a trip. Very nice, comfortable uh, way to travel, go ashore, see various things, wildlife, comfortable ship to, and cabin and excellent food. And the, and the ship takes you right up to the, to the glacier. Wildlife along the way on this um, cruise. Then south of the southern ice field, you have another possibility, another trip on the same similar uh, yacht, the Rook Kawaskar and his ship. The, temp the, the landscape starts to be a bit more rugged and in the south. As you can see here, glaciers, mountains, excellent facilities on board. It's a very comfortable way to see the southern landscape. Then when you go right down to the south, the um, Tierra Australis, this area of uh, Tierra del Fuego on the Australis cruise takes you to Cape Horn. And that allows you to travel on the Straits of Magellan, the Beagle Channel. And the, the, the water is quite calm because it's between all these myriad of uh, islands. And you um, then, come out to Cape Horn. Now here the, the, the sea can be more rough um, and it's also very long days. I wanted to point out that this area here in Southern uh, Chile and Argentina is about 53 degrees latitude south, uh, more or less like Manchester is north. So you, are, you have very long days in the summer, both for trekking as, we, as I mentioned on the, in the Torres del Paine, but also for, um, um, just coming back from the excursions, you have time to unwind, to relax, and um, also meet up with other passengers, your fellow travelers, either in, at the lodges or on the boat. Excellent food, um, accommodation, cabins. And you have both excursions ashore where the guide tells you about the local uh, flora and fauna, as well as you have this amazing landscape passing in front of the ship, as well as in this picture here, you see how small the ship is in relation to the, to the mountains around. So it gives you a sense of um, the uh, magnitude of these uh, landscapes and glaciers. Now, this is a lucky uh, occasion. It's a Cape Horn on a, on a sunny, calm day. It's rare. But uh, I was fortunate to have had this uh, climate, as you can see, it's like a little lake on Cape Horn. Um, so it does happen. 
and you I can vouch for it. So if the weather is too, too uh, uh, tough and too um, strong and the waves too strong, they, they, they don't land. You go round Cape Horn, but you cannot uh, land because the um, area to land here is rather too precarious. This is the, also the kind of landscape that you see on, on these crews, totally uninhabited areas. You go ashore on these pangas and you have um, a penguin colony there that you can see the penguins are very friendly. And this is one example uh, quite impressive that uh, struck me was this glacier on top of a mountain. Those glaciers, as usual, come up to the sea or um, and stretch down. But this glacier is on top of a mountain and then as it melts, it becomes a torrent of uh, water coming down to the um, Beagle Channel. Great experience. Now, from this area, from Ushuaia, it's also a, a boarding point, an access point for Antarctica. And you can see here the Drake Passage and the kind of trips that you can, cruises that you can take from Ushuaia, Falkland Islands, South Georgia, South Orkney, and Antarctica Peninsula. Um, one or the other, or you can see both, depending on the duration that you choose. This is the kind of experience here you have. It's really a wildlife uh, paradise um, because nobody lives there, nobody disturbs them. And the ship, this is one of our favorite ships, the Sea Spirit, excellent accommodation, excellent crew. And one of the important things is the number of people on board because with uh, up to 100 people or around 100 passengers, you can go ashore every day and there's no restrictions. You can spend more time ashore and uh, can even uh, stay one night on the ice um, if the weather is good or you can take kayaks, but it's, it's the number of people on board is very important to def def define your experience. So now I would like to uh, ask my colleague Nick to go through our uh, itineraries, to suggest the itineraries to join all these different destinations together. So Nick. Yep, Thank, thanks Paolo. Uh, wow, such a range of, uh, of different activities and experiences throughout Argentina and Chile. Um, you know, you might be thinking, what, which, uh, Places do I go to? How do I fit them all together? Uh, we've got a number of tour itineraries uh, that we can suggest to you, um, which you can book as they appear. Uh, you can see them on our website and in our brochure, but you can also uh, ask us to, to tailor them to your um, preferences and, and specifications as well. So please do call us and ask us about that. Um, first here, we've got the Explorer Tour. This is really a sort of once in a lifetime blowout over a month uh, through um, South America with uh, Rio and Buenos Aires and Patagonia, and then uh, a cruise down to Antarctica as well. That's uh, if you're gonna go once and uh, never go again, um, uh, definitely a, a, a big once in a lifetime trip. Um, on the more sort of accessible level, perhaps, uh, Sereno Tour is our starter tour, if you like, of Chile of about two weeks, covers everything pretty much that, that you would want to see uh, with the desert in the north, the glaciers in the south, and some time in the Lake District and, uh, and Santiago as well. Um, equally for Argentina, the San Martin tour this is a little bit more comprehensive, actually, with uh, a variety of stops in the north uh, of Argentina with Salta and Iguazu and also the wetlands areas of Iberá and then down to uh, the Lake District to uh, spend some time with Gabi uh, and on to the glaciers of Patagonia as well uh, in about a three week trip. If you want to try and combine Chile and Argentina, there are a number of ways to do that. Our Magellan tour uh, in about two weeks is a circular trip uh, from Buenos Aires uh, and goes down to the Lake District and uh, Patagonia and inc uh, includes one of the cruises that Paolo was uh, talking to you about, the Australis cruise. Equally, if you prefer not to uh, cruise, then our Yamana uh, is a, 
um, sort of U-shaped itineraries you can see on the map there, starting in Buenos Aires uh, and finishing in Santiago de Chile, going down to uh, Argentine, Patagonia, and coming back up again through Chile and Patagonia. Uh, and um, there's a possibility also to add on the, the Lake District there if you, if you choose. Um, I mentioned before about being able to see the itineraries on the uh, website, veloso.com. We have a tool uh, there which allows you to download an itinerary for yourself. So not just looking at it on the web page, but downloading a, a PDF. And what you can do with that is actually choose your preferred start date, as you can see here with the uh, calendar choosing tool, select a starting date. And then if you click on this button, download itinerary that will uh, produce and automatically download to your computer uh, an itinerary starting on your preferred date that matches uh, that itinerary so that you could see what days you would be in what locations etc uh, and will help you with the the planning of your trip uh, and this is an example uh, of you know just a couple of pages of what you would see in the uh, downloaded tour itinerary that comes from that tool. So please do use that um, in your trip planning. It's a very useful tool uh, and we've had uh, a lot of a lot of good feedback on it. So um, we hope that you find it useful as well. So uh, that's the end pretty much from us. Uh, apologies, we have got a, gone a little bit over time, but as you can see, there was just so much to include. We really didn't want to leave anything out. Um, so uh, does anyone have any questions? I can't see any questions in the uh, in the chat box. Anything uh, through on the email, Berenice? No, uh, no questions so far, Nick. OK, that's absolutely fine. Would anyone like to put their hand up and ask a, a question? Um, <clears throat> uh, we will stay on for a few minutes afterwards as well. If anyone would like to approach us uh, separately um, afterwards, uh, please feel free to to do that. Um, otherwise, uh, from myself and of, uh, of course the rest of us at Veloso Tours, thank you very much for attending. Uh, we hope you have enjoyed the webinar and we do hope that you'll contact us and um, start planning your next trip to South America with us very soon. Do your prices include the flights or are they just the, the trip round South America? <coughs> Our uh, published prices do, I believe, include the yes. uh, flights from the UK. Yes, yes they, are they do. Right. That's an indicative cost. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, the, the flights are included and then we need to, as Nick said, an indicative cost because we have to go and book the flights on the dates chosen in order to provide a guaranteed price. Right. But those indicative prices already include uh, flights. Uh-huh. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Very interesting. Maybe the only thing, thank you. I have a question, please. Go ahead. Um, based on the Bariloche area, is it possible to get down to a scale and uh, to Rellum, the Welsh heritage areas? It is possible. It is quite a long way. You would probably have be best to fly. Um, the road is quite, the, the landscape across the Pampa is quite barren mm -hmm. and you can uh, travel from Bariloche to um, Trileo and um, this Welsh area of, near, near Puerto Madryn. But uh, it's probably best to fly from Buenos Aires to, the, to um, Trileo and, um, and then carry on the trip. So we, we, we do plan the itinerary in a different way. And the, there, are, there are no direct flights from Bariloche to Trileo. So you would have to go over land, which is a very long journey. Yeah. So, um, but it's possible to include it, of course, yes. Okay. Gabby, did you have anything to uh, add on that? Yes, we can do it. Yeah, but by, by road, we have very, but it's a very long trip, as Paolo said. I agree with that. And, it's, uh, it's nice. Uh, at the beginning, you go along many different lakes at Bolson and from there to a scale. But then if you want to go all the way to, to the Welsh towns, it's a very it's quite a long journey covering all the Patagonian steppe. The scale is wonderful for Los Alerces National Park. It's, there is less infrastructure there. It's a very impressive national park that borders with Chile. 
but uh, we have arranged trips in the past um, mm -hmm. to that area. It's uh, seldom visited, but it's very impressive. Los Alerces. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Did anyone else have uh, any questions? I don't know if you want to uh, come on camera or just unmute yourself. I thought, what about the climate? When is the best time to go? I think maybe we, very didn't, important, we didn't mention very important. that. I'm sure everyone wants to know uh, that. So I think we forgot. Of maybe. course, uh, with South America, it's the Southern Hemisphere. Um, so the uh, seasons are reversed. Uh, and re effectively, the further south you go, um, the more pronounced the, the difference is. So if you're going down to the south of Chile and Argentina, you're going to be wanting to go in their summer, which is our winter. Uh, so the peak season is probably from middle of November through to uh, February or, or March. But really, the, the shoulder seasons are also very good to, to go. Um, so you might go down to Patagonia uh, or certainly to Bariloche, anywhere from mid-October um, through to, to April or so. Um, but these are the sort of times, um, and ev even for Buenos Aires or, or Santiago, you know, you like to be there in the summer when it's warm. Um, so uh, roughly speaking, from uh, our um, autumn, through to our springtime, that's when it's going to be uh, ideal over there. Um, I think we have a question here from uh, somebody has raised a hand. Yes, go uh, ahead. Hi, it's Vipin. I'm wondering, do you do a group tours at all or is it just individual itineraries? Uh, uh, Paolo, do you want to take that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's individual itineraries. Um, to be honest, Everyone has different um, choices and, and preferences of where to go, how long to stay in each place. And because of the uh, guides that we have in all the different locations, there isn't really a, a cost advantage in having groups. And as I mentioned, you can meet up with other people at the different destinations. So in Torres del Paine, you can uh, take excursions with other people who are staying at the same lodge as you. Right, right. Uh, and, and we find that everyone has so many different options that we can fulfill that there isn't really a need to, um, to have groups, unless it's a group of persons who, want, who know each other. Okay. We've had groups of friends, we've had groups from different uh, sources and uh, who, who want to travel together, in which case we can, of course, organize it. Okay, that's fine. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Very interesting presentation, and I uh, enjoyed it. Uh, we look forward to sometime when the COVID is over now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Do we have any other question or thing? Or? Uh, that's it. Well, okay. thank you. Look forward to seeing you. You can always contact us at any time by email or phone or um, get in touch and we will uh, take it further and answer any more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone.